Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of St. Paul. We are located in Matamidai, Minnesota. Well, Hosanna. Welcome to this Palm Sunday here at First Christian Church of St. Paul. And welcome to this to our online worship service here at First Christian of St. Paul. We are located in Matamidai, Minnesota. My name is Dennis Sanders. I am the pastor. While we aren't able to worship in person at this time, we are glad that we can worship together in the spirit. If this is your first time visiting us, on behalf of everyone here at First Christian, I'd like to say hello. And also, for you to consider to go to our website at fccstpaul.org, where you will be able to watch this and, and recent worship services, write up a prayer request, and also just get to know a little bit more about us as a congregation and the denomination that we belong to, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. A few announcements before we continue with worship. Thursday, April 1st, is our special Monday Thursday service. It begins actually at our homes at 6 p.m. at our dining tables where we will read uh, John 13 together and then we will come together as a community online on April 1st at 6.30 p.m. There will be a short reflection, some singing, and then also conclude with the Lord's Supper. So we hope that you can join us on that day. And then on Sunday, Easter, Easter Sunday, April 4th, we will be worshiping right out there. We'll be worshiping in the, on the lawn at 10 a.m. Sunday, April 4th. So we hope that you can join us for that celebratory event and um, hope it's we, and, and we, it looks like there, it will be good weather on that Sunday. And then put April 18th on your calendar because that is a Sunday tentatively that we will be back in the building, at least on a, a, a somewhat regular basis. Um, we will be doing, and for the time being, using some special precautions so people will be masked. We won't have any congregational singing. Uh, Communion will be by the little kind of communion uh, packets instead of how we have it where we're passing the bread around. So we will, for the time being, be having a few precautions, but we are going to be worshiping in person starting April 18th. We will actually also still be doing some form of online worship. It might be in a truncated form um, where there'll be kind of more not the full service that it has been for the past year, but we see online worship as a ministry to reach out to people. And so we wanna continue it on in some way. And it also helps if you are not able to attend in person that you can take part in the worship service. Finally, just like to let you know again about Project Abundance. Project Abundance is uh, where we are asking people who are receiving their stimulus checks to give a portion of it to the mission fund here at First Christian. We are giving it to three different charities. Uh, you can learn more about this by going to our website at fccstpaul.org. This is a way that we are doing this as a way of discipleship, to know that to follow Jesus means that everything that we have, everything in our lives, it's God's. And so we want to, in a way, show who is in charge of our lives and, and especially our checkbook. And so we hope that you will consider giving some of your stimulus check, whatever you feel is right to give, to give it to our, our mission fund. And you can do that online or you can mail it in. Make sure in both cases you write Project Abundance um, so that we know where it's going to go. Well, today is, as we said, Palm Sunday. It is the Sunday every year 
where we come together to um, see Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And who doesn't love a parade? And Jesus enters into Jerusalem, probably in what might be the oddest parade ever. The crowd is shouting, Hosanna, which actually means, save us. How did Jesus save the people? Did they know that he was going to save them? And do we understand what it means that Jesus saves? So join us this today, this morning, as Pastor Rob Hamilton will preach on this most unusual parade. Let us continue with worship.
We now continue our worship service with the call to worship. In this litany, I will start it, and if you are willing, please respond with the following. On the way to Calvary, palms were waved to honor the king. Please join me. Crosses of palm unite us in our devotion to Jesus of Nazareth and focus our gaze on the king, the lamb, the son of God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humbled and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, as and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. We now come to God in this time of confession. We will begin with a little bit of silence, and then I will begin the litany, and you can respond with the following. God, hear our prayer, listen to our hearts, Fill us with your forgiveness. Let us begin with silence. After a year of struggling to follow Jesus faithfully, we know we have worn down others by our angry words, and how we have wearied loved ones with poor choices. Yet we also recognize that in every moment of every day, God has been with us with that love which never gives up, that grace which is always offered freely to us. So as we begin our journey through another holy week of worshiping apart, yet strangely more together than we can ever imagine, help us to always choose humility over hubris, weakness over strength, tenderness over bullying, and seek to stay faithful as we can in these days. We pray this in the name of our teacher Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, peace be upon you. A reading from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Now let us attend to God's word for us today. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. 
Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends this reading of this holy word. May it be good news to us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please pray with me. O gracious God, abundant to love and merciful in your grace, today we celebrate your entry into Jerusalem on a lowly colt. O God, in this moment, as we struggle to see your world made flesh, give us a glimpse in this moment to that more perfect of union with you. O oh God, I humbly ask that the words I speak and the meditations of our hearts and minds might be acceptable as our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Once again, we hear those words. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Once again, we hear that story that we have heard from the youngest of times. The story about Jesus entering Jerusalem. In the midst of these cheers, I want to explore a question about abandonment. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he who comes! Those shouts of joy, those shouts of hope, Every time I read that, or every time I hear the psalm of their praise, I have a question that lingers in my heart. Where were these people on Monday, Thursday? Where were these people on Good Friday? As I have read this text multiple times and had m multiple encounters with it, I come away to see their, the answer to that question, while never really expressed in the text, I have this prophetic imagination to see that there are three responses to that question. First is the group of people who showed up for the parade, for that triumphant entry. I don't know if you've had this experience, but you see a group of people along the, the street, and maybe you are a bystander to this, and you watch as they jump and sing and dance, and you feel even though you really are not sure who they are or what they're doing, you feel a positive sense because in that moment 
you can sense something much more. Yet, when the parade moves on, that feeling of happiness and joy vanishes. And so it was for probably many on that day, they came to see the spectacle of Jesus, probably not even really sure who he was. And once the parade had passed them by, so they went on with the rest of their life. The second group of people, or the people who probably were with Jesus before this, Maybe they were followers of Jesus. And then on the night when he gets arrested, they flee. They had hopes and dreams to see Jesus be the one to destroy and overcome the empire, which lay siege to their homeland. They struggled to understand how that could take place. And so, they couldn't make sense of it. And seeing that, they did what was in their best interest and left. Now the third group of people I imagine are a group of people who stay with Jesus up until the conviction. When Pilate brings Jesus into the group of people which he has assembled, and he asks them, what do you want me to do with him? Do you want me to release Jesus? Or do you want me to release Barabbas? And they say Barabbas. For these people, that was the nail in the coffin, if you will, of their hopes of seeing a new Jerusalem. When it became clear that the popular... Um, the popularity and the popular movement in Jerusalem was not behind Jesus, they probably too saw that there was no possibility, and so they too fled. What do we make of these three groups of people? How do we make sense of them? God's will is done in spite of our abandonment of God, leads us to see the mission of the church. In spite of our abandonment of God, God's will is done. In this story, notice everyone abandons Christ. No one is there for him when he needs them the most. And yet, God does not abandon us. I think this is powerful. It shows us that while we may engage in the hope of a better day, it is God's will and God's will alone that creates that opportunity. And in the midst of that, it is God's will that completes what God has set forth You know, out of this insight, I get a clear sense of the mission of our church. I see these insights growing out of this ability for God's will to be done in spite of us. First, our actions are not the perfection 
of God's will. Yes, we may try to do as good as we can, and we may even sometimes surpass where we might expect, but we will all fall short of the glory of God. In that knowledge, we need to understand our community is here to respond to that abandonment. To help people when they fail by giving them a, a, a sense of sanctuary, a breathing space between the wrong they have done and the right they can do in Christ. Second of all, we need to uplift and support one another as we strive for those better standards, as we strive to live into the body of Christ. Yes, we will fail, but we will always strive to encourage one another to grow in Christ. The more I reflect on these two, the more I come away to see that the church's mission is about reflecting upon God in the unexpected moments. You know, as I reflect on this, and as I reflect on where we are today and where we were a year ago, so much of our lives have changed, and yet so much of it feels the same. Yes, we have struggled this year, and yet I have seen us take bold actions, transforming the way we do worship, the way we do meetings, transforming even the way we teach. And in the midst of this challenges, guess what? We have proclaimed the good news. Did it go as well the way we would have planned? Hell no. But I still believe we did live into that hope. There's a future ahead of us, and yes, that can be scary. I don't know what is ahead of us, but I trust in the growth is a miracle that we can, that can show us a sign on which ways we should move ahead. In the neighborhood I live, we have an American flag right at the front. I have taken on the responsibility of lowering that flag when the flag is supposed to be at half staff. It's a sombering task to do. And I remember last week, as I was about to raise the flag, and then the next day I had to lower it once again. First because of the eight lives that were lost in Atlanta, and then lowered once again due to the shooting in Colorado. We have had seven mass shootings in three months. Many believe we can't change. I have a friend in Canada who looks at the news of our time and place and can't make sense of it. They look at us and they are astounded. What will it take, they ask. 
Not a group of young children dying. Not a group of religious believers worshiping God dying. Many scoff at us and say they can't do it. And when I hear that, there's an anger that is within me. It fills me in that moment. There's an anger that wants me to tell them that they are wrong. I know as a nation, we can affirm the sanctity of life and dignity therein. That we can demand that those who create and propagate these weapons of death and destruction must stand and must be held accountable by law. I understand that we can affirm the dignity and sanctity of life and also understand that there needs to be stringent legal ways to license those who would choose to bear arms in an orderly way as required by the Second Amendment for the common protection. You know, today we celebrate Jesus going into Jerusalem. We remember those who cheered and hoped to see a new Jerusalem. Even as we weep, may our weeping allow us to see more clearly a bold sense of justice. Not a justice for those who have died. While we need that most definitely. But also a justice for those who are yet unborn. That they may never lose a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, a grandchild, or child, due to this epidemic of gun violence plaguing our country. You know, I know where God is calling me to go. I fervently believe that we can succeed at this. We can make the United States safe once again. But just like those who praised and celebrate in that parade, I have to believe that God has something better for me and for you and for our country as a whole. And if we trust in God's life-giving, reconciling, redeeming love, maybe we can see it as it rides by us on a colt. May it be so for us. Amen, amen, amen.
It has been a week. I think that we say that too much lately. We have seen, probably in the last week and a half, shootings in Atlanta and in Boulder, Colorado. There is a lot of fear, especially within the Asian American community, feeling that they are targeted because of who they are. We seem more divided than ever before by anything imaginable, but especially ide ideologically. And the world seems to have so many threats that are both near and far. So it is in these times that we come to God in prayer. Please join me. You sent word and spirit to gather up chaos. As they said, God has need of it. As you transformed it into creation, cults to carry kings and servants, palms to sway in breezes and waves and hands, stones to be used as foundations for homes, as well as for kingdoms. You shaped humanity in your image, inviting us to enter through the gate of love. But we long to be filled with power and with privilege, and so blessed sin and death as they came to us. The men and women that we call prophets came to awaken us to your call to be sustained by love, yet we continued to give new names to the temptations which delighted us. So you sent Jesus to us not in power and wealth, but as one who simply was a teacher of steadfast love and unfailing hope. With those who put down their, in the, their hearts in welcome, with those who clutch doubt behind their backs, we join in songs of praise. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of salvation. All creation joins in recognizing this moment of grace. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who is peace and glory for us. Hosanna is the highest. Setting aside privilege and power, holy God, your child, our brother, chose to be made in our image so we might see you face to face. He could have bossed us around telling us what to do, but he chose to teach us compassion because that was what was in his heart. He could have turned his back on us or kept his earbuds lodged in tight, but chose to listen to our stories, to listen to our hearts breaking. He could have hardened his face in judgment for our foolish choices, but turned it towards what awaited him in that place where people would reject him, friends would betray him, the powers would contemn him, and death would claim victory over him until you raise him to resurrection life. So it is with this Jesus, who is our friend, who is our savior, who is our brother, we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for, from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ. May God's presence be with you. May God's love abide with you. May God's love that is beyond our understanding allow you to love yourself without hesitation, to love others without restraint. May that love be with you and those you love and those who no one loves, now and forever. Amen.